joining us. And thank you for um, your participation in our Under Fire 4 exhibition this year. I first want to thank all of our jurors and our moderator tonight for their participation. Um, I don't want to take up too much time because there's a lot to get through tonight. We've got some fabulous work to show you. Um, our moderator tonight is Amy Roper Lyons. Amy is vice president of Enamel Guild Northeast. Um, she is published in many publications and has uh, work in both private and public collections throughout the country. She's an accomplished enamelist. So please welcome Amy Roper Lyons. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and welcome again, everyone. I'm so glad you could join us tonight for this discussion about the Under Fire 4 exhibition with the jurors who made, um, you know, who shaped it. And I'm really excited to hear what, you know, their thoughts on the work of the, um, the work in the exhibit and, um, and uh, their thoughts about where enameling is going today, the whole, you know, the field of enameling. So let me introduce them. Um, I'm going in alphabetical order, just uh, to let you know. Um, first, we have Harlan Butt. Welcome, Harlan. And um, Harlan is an artist with over 40 years of experience working in metals and enamel. His vessels are inspired by the human relationship to wilderness and the natural environment. Harlan is a professor emeritus at the University of North Texas. Um, where he taught jewelry and metalworking for many years. He's past president of the Enamelist Society, past president of the Society of North American Goldsmiths, and a fellow of the American Crafts Council, among other honors. He has been artist in residence at a number of different national parks, and his work has been exhibited internationally and is in the collection of the Smithsonian Institute, the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City, and many more. Welcome, Harlan. Thank you. Um, next, um, we have Jessica Calderwood. Um, Jessica is- Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. Jessica is a renowned sculptor and jewelry artist. She trained primarily as a metalsmith and enamelist. She uses a combination of traditional and industrial metalworking processes as a means to make statements about contemporary life. Her work has been exhibited extensively through the US and internationally. She earned her BFA from the Cleveland Institute of Art and an MFA from the um, Arizona University. Jessica has participated in the John Michael Kohler Arts Industry Program Residency. Um, as well as other prestigious artist residencies. And her work has been published in Metalsmith Magazine, American Craft, Niche, Ornament, the Lark 500 series, and the Art of Enameling. She is currently an Associate Professor of Art at Ball State University in Indiana. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have Patty Fleischer, who co-founded Gallery Loop in Montclair, New Jersey in 2006. Hello. And hi, hi, Patty. Gallery Loop is a wonderful gallery um, focused on jewelry and metal arts. And um, in 2019, she became the sole director of the gallery. She represents an international array of jewelry masters along with many newer artists. She's organized numerous memorable ex exhibitions at the gallery, participated in prestigious art fairs, and collaborated with other institutions and placed important works in major museum collections. Patty has also supported the publication of numerous gallery loop exhibition catalogs and monographs on gallery artists. Welcome, Patty. Thank you. It's good to be here. Okay, well, so um, now. Uh, Kim, you were going to um, announce the winners, uh, um, yes. uh, the prize winners of the exhibit. Why don't yes. you go next? That's right. I'm going to share my screen.
bear with me. You're doing great, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, winner of the third prize. Can you see that photo? Kim, I think you need to go into slideshow view because we can see. Oh, you can see the presenter view, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oops, I just did the same thing again, hold on, sorry. There you go, there you go, great. Looking good. Now I'll probably butcher this name, Megan Schmeidel. And the name of the piece is Roadkill Rabbit and that's a brooch. That's the third prize winner. Second prize winner goes to Clota Malloy, Supergirl Medallion. And third prize winner, oops, sorry, went the wrong way. First prize, Wu Ching Chi, the end of the season vessel. Wow, well, that's exciting to see. Those are certainly three really strong pieces. So maybe this is a good time to um, start by asking our jurors um, to each speak about one or two of these pieces and, um, you know, say what really struck you about them and, and what you thought, um, what you thought spoke to you from, for these pieces. Um, let's see, do you want to, Harlan, do you want to start? Okay, well, I can talk about number three, <clears throat> um, the third prize, uh, Roadkill. When I first saw this piece, it shocked me a little bit. <clears throat> and uh, it, in a way, is it's graphic <clears throat> because my first uh, thought was that it's showing the blood coming out of the, the, the dead rabbit and that's um, off-putting in a way. <clears throat> but the more I thought about it and the more I looked at it, um, I thought it was an elegant way of presenting that. Um, it's uh, the subject matter is something we don't deal with often, but it's something we're all familiar with. And um, to take that subject matter and to present it in this sort of sophisticated way with the very nuances of color and uh, the interesting use of the beads, which are thought of as a, as a precious item representing the blood or the uh, internal organs or whatever, um, <clears throat> I uh, warm to it more after looking at it over and over and over again, going through the slides. So I thought it was a, a unique way of using the material and uh, it was an interesting sort of commentary on, uh, you know, an object we tend to ignore, but which is, um, you know, a, a, an element of nature that we encounter all the time, at least if you drive a car. Yeah, I, and, and um, it's a very interesting choice of subject matter, <laughs> for sure. And the, uh, there's a lot of humor in that too, I think. Um, and uh, thinking about the wearer wearing that pin um, and what the reaction of the pub, you know, people might be to it mm -hmm. if you went and wore that pin. That's, that's a... Yeah, I'm sure there's a certain amount of movement involved with the, uh, uh, the beads uh, moving. Right, right. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Um, okay. Well, Jessica, would you like to speak to one of these um, as well? Sure, I, I can. I want to say, though, um, just like on a, a personal note for this morning. So I have a cat um, named Muffin who lives uh, partially outside and partially in my studio. And she brought a decapi decapitated chipmunk to our back door this morning, which is a pretty frequent occurrence, I'm embarrassed to say. But uh, the first thing I thought of was this brooch. <laughs> 
I think it re that resonated for me. Um, but I do just want to say a sort of a macro statement that um, it was really tough to come up with the awards because there were so many wonderful pieces. There was a long list that we were kind of um, mining through and trying to weigh in terms of um, all that we agreed on. So there was just really stellar work from, from the submissions for this exhibition. Um, but yeah, uh, in terms of the awards, uh, I really responded to the vessels by Wu Ching. And this artist, uh, the work really resonated for me. Um, mm -hmm. I think at first on a, just like on a guttural aesthetic level, um, because they were just so uh, beautifully crafted. Um, mm -hmm. And so this was the piece that was awarded, but there were a few other vessels that were also submitted and uh, that I also responded to. And I think what worked for me was that I often see nature as a subject. Um, and that is very prevalent in our enameling field as well as many other fields, but there was something about the uniqueness of this voice and the way it was executed and formed that I thought merited some distinction. So it definitely is, you know, speaking to the idea of ecosystem, right? And I thought that was really fascinating to create that in a vessel form. So kind of really related that to um, something that was a little bit global. And then, and then I just think the the skill in terms of having something that looked so thin and so delicate, um, but then there's these little moments that have some sort of um, like rendering and detail. So there's some sort of nice opportunities for focal point uh, and sort of a a way to move you around this form that I thought was just really um, really poetic and really nicely done. Yeah, yeah, I. It's a and it's it's a very unique piece. Like you don't usually see vessels quite like that. Oh. Yeah, using a skill that we often learn as our very first metalsmithing skill too, right? Uh, and then students, usually an artist, they move on from that. Um, and I kind of like seeing that revisited and um, rearticulated in a way that has a a uniqueness to the voice. So. Um, one of the listeners is asking, do we know the scale of this piece? And I certainly don't. I don't know if you may not either, but it, it might have. Does anybody remember from the description? I don't remember. I'm going to see if I can find it. I have the show open. I have a feeling about it, which could be completely incorrect, because sometimes photographs are misleading, that it's mm -hmm. like the size of like, like, six inches that you would hold in your hands and your hands wouldn't quite touch, but almost. That's what it looks like. Okay, so I found it. It's 23 centimeters by 23 centimeters. That, oh, wow, so that's 10, almost 10 by 10 inches. That's bigger than I thought. It's a nice scale. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. Is, but it is, you're right, it's bigger than handheld. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and um, Patty, would, um, would you like to... Sure. So I, I would just like to say uh, something about this this piece first. That to me, what 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 I kept thinking about when I looked at it, what was some sort of that it was an an egg form mm -hmm. um, in a certain way, um, and shattered shell, um, bringing forth some sort of new life. And I just thought it was very poetic in that sense and very beautiful, very, very delicate. Um, and going back to the first piece, Roadkill, that Harlan spoke about, that was an image that just stopped me in my tracks because there was this perverseness to it. And yet you wanted to keep I wanted to keep looking at it. And um, when Harlan mentioned the idea of maybe these beads shaking around that there'd be movement when someone was wearing it, that was also um, interesting to think about that this, that this animal had you know, just been alive just moments before, probably. And you know this kind of 
of thing happens all the time in my neighborhood, in our area, where you see these animals lying, lying on the road and you, um, it takes a piece like this to make you stop and really look at it. And um, I, for, for that reason, I thought it was very special, but I'm glad that the um, Supergirl medallion was um, left for me to speak about because I loved this piece. Um, I thought that there, it was again, very poetic uh, that it was, Aesthetically, I just thought it was beautiful. I love the graphic nature of it, um, but also the fact that um, it was just this black and white palette and it was so stark. And yet, and when I looked at it, I could, it seemed like it was just oozing pain. And for me as a gallery, uh, owner thinking about pieces to bring in. This is a piece that I think I would have in the gallery and feel like um, it was really, it was really telling its own story and people could look at it and relate to it. And if someone did want to put it on, it would function as a piece that another person viewing it would really want to know about. And it would start that conversation. And for me, the contemporary jewelry, it's so much about that. It's, it's how this jewelry functions on the body and how it starts those conversations. Um, so I thought this piece was really, really strong. I mean, it made me want to even go and look at this artist's website and, <laughs> and learn more about it. And there was a beautiful video sort of telling the story as well. And I also thought that the, um, the images were very important. Sorry. The fact that you can see it on the body and you could feel the pain of what this piece was trying to convey. It just wanted um, to go like on its own to like, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I was trying to show the other views and then it just wanted to keep going. There was also, I think, a, a, a sense of heaviness to this piece, you know, that it was carrying a, a certain weight Mm -hmm. of talking about the human condition and issues that people face every day. Um, and, you know, a note about our society today that seemed very relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I could chime in and add my thoughts about it was, yeah, my take on it was that it was very much of the moment and talking about mental health issues and kind of turning that into a conversation, you know, that could be accessed through jewelry. And I think that there, see, I, I thought about it as more like the, the pillowing, or I'm assuming it was through a die forming process to kind of get that convex form um, was just a, a really nice uh, contrast to kind of create tension to something that was such a heavy subject. And I, I really responded to some of the, the tension that was created by using formal contrast with, uh, with the content. Mm -hmm. I like that idea of the pillowing mm -hmm. because it, it's some sort of sense of comfort yeah. for you know, the, this intense subject. Yeah. And yeah, and, and I like that. I like that idea. And I think, yeah, I think it was really a good way for this artist to be able to start a dialogue about these issues, something that's not that easy for people to talk about. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, I can't really from the photographs read the text. And I wonder, is 
were you able to read the text? Is it meant to be a cohesive text or just fragments? It, it looks like fragments when you're looking at the piece. Right. Um, but when I went back and it made me want to go back and look at, learn more about it. And when I uh -huh. went back and, and looked, I think it's one person's story. Mm -hmm. And she was gathering many stories. But this, this was one person who um, talked about issues that she had had growing up and then, um, you know, her own feelings of inferiority and her dealing with alcoholism and many, many things, um, and then starting to, to rise above it. Hmm, wow. uh, yeah. So but, this is a story that the artist collected. She was collecting stories on mental health issues, mm. um, speaking to people who had, had gone through hard times. And this was a response to one story. Interesting. So uh, was that a, a theme in this grouping of work, not just this piece, but the, the whole exhibit as a whole? Were there a lot of um, personal themes like, uh, about mental health or otherwise, you know, people being um, impacted by our current situation, you know, with the pandemic and political divisiveness and all this. Did you find that to be a common theme? Or, I think or? that narrative work showed up over and over again, not in all the work, but in a number of pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think not only <clears throat> um, because of the pandemic, but I think that people feeling isolated have a need to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it's personal. Uh, I think it has to go uh, beyond the personal though to become a little more um, universal so that yeah. everyone can relate to it or at least an audience can relate to it. Uh, so even though the story itself might be personal, it story has to go beyond the, mm -hmm. the personal story to something a little more universal. Yeah, I agree, Harlan, because I think that, you know, when someone looks at this piece, they don't need to know that backstory. Mm -hmm. um, they, I think that, you know, they'll be able to get a sense of what just certain emotions that this, that this piece carries with it, or they'll be able to put their own story on it. But I don't think um, that um, all narrative work has to have text. No, not <clears throat> at when, all. Of course but not. when you but when you do employ text on a piece, you, you have sort of a challenge because a lot of what we see with imagery and text has to do with advertising or uh, other things. And so frequently, there has to be a strategy of using the text in such a way that the imagery comes first, what you see affects you in some way. And then as you uh, look closer or investigate further and, and read the text, then it may add to the meaning of the piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so with this piece, you really can't read much. You mm -hmm. just get little bits here and there. Yeah, but it's interesting as you look at it just very, very quickly, the, the words that pop out like alcohol, coping, subconscious, you immediately know this is not a happy story. <laughs> yeah. Right. I don't know how, I mean, how, how she did that or he, I'm not sure if it's he or she. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how you do that, but it, it's very effective. Like, Yeah. Well, I think there's almost uh, a, um, I mean, the black is really strong in the piece, right? as some sort of, you know, connoting grief. Right. It, it's interesting that two of the three pieces are uh, use a, a minimum amount of color. Mm -hmm. And enamel is thought of as being a very colorful, brilliant sort of material. And yet I think, you know, if we're talking about directions in enamel, I think that um, uh, it's not that we need to eliminate color, but using it in a sensitive way that employs color as a, as a, uh, uh, pointing to what the meaning is, uh, or what mm -hmm. the work is about. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
I, I mean, do you think that, that you saw uh, that was that another theme that you observed in these works is um, a, a sort of like moving away from bright colors? I don't know. There were some really uh, brilliant colors no, in, in okay. the work. Uh, it, it, it was maybe a thread that ran through the work, but I don't think it mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, a main theme. Yeah, maybe we were in just a very somber mood when we were picking these. <laughs> 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 Kim, why don't you start the slideshow? Okay. Um, and there so was can... a question about the the process for this. Oh, was it answered? Okay, Kim got it. Well, oh. I just looked it up on my phone and it didn't mention anything about etching. Yeah. It just said that the piece is all copper and the centerpiece is where the enamel is. Right. Yeah. Um, so it it's I was also questioning that and I it's very difficult to tell even with the detail shots it's it it could be it could be etched it could be a decal it could be laser etched into the enamel all of those I think, are I think the writing the writing may be laser etched is that the enamel you mean because uh, the outside edge is definitely acid etched on the black part okay mm -hmm. but maybe in the center um but it's difficult to tell. Okay. And it wasn't described. I do think that um, Cloda is in the uh, Zoom call. Does oh. she want to answer? Oh. <laughs> she says well, the enamel. Go. Oh, it's decal. Okay. Decal. Mm -hmm. Hi, congratulations. <laughs> So were there any pieces that dealt with the with the pandemic or you know, mm -hmm. at, at all? Um, there were. I was actually just looking that up to. This is a piece name. that I really liked. If we go back one, this this piece really spoke to me. Um, it just doesn't want me to pause. Yeah. When. When I hit the arrow, it just wants to run by itself. So let me see if this will fix that. <laughs> is, is this a piece, Patty, the, with the flowers? Yeah. 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 I, I, um, that piece um, stayed with me. Um, because I, I thought it was also speaking about, um, you know, current cultural issues. This, this I think, is like a remnant of um, the enamel is meant to be some sort of remnant of, of a culture that has been destroyed and is now just sitting on cement. Um, so I thought that was a really strong piece. And to me, the, the enamel work looked really beautiful. I think, um, I don't know what, what the cultural reference is, um, but, you know, I thought about all of so many um, museums and um, pieces of art that have been destroyed over the past few years um, and this really seemed like it was speaking to that issue and I, I liked it a lot. Huh, interesting. I don't know if I would have um, pulled all that out of the piece. It's wonderful to hear your, you know, your thoughts on it, your reaction to it. Um, And Marjorie Simon says she saw that pattern in Istanbul in the Topkapi Palace from the Ottoman Empire. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also thought Ana Lopez's work was really strong uh, for the submission of the online exhibition. I think that there is something that is really interesting to me about taking snippets from your your local, your sense of place, your architecture, your local industrial landscape, and kind of creating these moments to examine that further. Uh, and I think also the way it's presented and contextualized, especially with this piece here, I think 
you know, start some interesting conversations. And I get this is a very, uh, the enamel is not really the forefront. Um, it's really, again, it's an achromatic piece. Um, but I think that the way that this artist is using enamel to kind of um, not decorate, but describe uh, is a really interesting distinction. That's an interesting way to look at it. I, you know, um, yeah, I didn't uh, see that as an industrial piece until you brought that up. I was thinking of it as just a, a, a triptych of vessels, kind of, some kind of odd vessels, which it can also be, yes. which is uh, kind of cool that, you know, it can be thought of in these very different ways. It's, yeah. it's diverse. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I wonder, uh, did anybody find any works that really surprised you that you didn't expect or, or um, that were just something very new? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if I should wait till they come up or on the slideshow or. <laughs> no, you don't have to wait. You can, um, if you start talking about it, Kim will jump there. Patty, you had a finger up if you wanted to talk about something. Oh, well, I, I just, um, Melissa Cameron's piece, which is so spare, mm -hmm. um, and it was, um, it was a hanger. I think it's an enameled hanger, but it's meant to be a piece of jewelry. And that um, I was really curious about. And what I wished uh, had been there was, um, some images of it on the body because I can't, I couldn't figure out how it would work. Here, here we go. How it would work on the body. You, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just a piece that I, I have, um, still have questions about. Mm -hmm. um, Anyone else? Any, any thoughts on that one or, or another piece that surprised you? This was the one that surprised me. I, I thought it was uh, interesting. It's the one I wrote her name down, Mary Lucking. Uh, Kim, can, you, can you go back to that, Kim? Was it the one with the book panels? The, yeah. yeah. Okay. I just, I, uh, yeah, I think it's called Poems in Silver and Glass. And uh, for me, it just surprised me in a pleasant way because it was thinking about enamel in a completely different form and context than what we're really used to seeing. And so it's, it's much more performative. So she essentially uh, created these enamel studies that are pretty abstracted. They're patterns, they're color play, um, and they're scaled to sleeve into a series of booklets that are then in, installed sneakily into a library. So that way, as someone's browsing and searching, they might choose one of these little enameled vignettes for contemplation. And I just thought it was a really lovely idea. It was, it was playful, it was fun, um, and it surprised me. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I think that was a great idea also. Yeah, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, rather, you know, usually you think about when you're uh, looking at books about jewelry, you're going to be seeing images of jewelry in a book. But here it was really changing it up and you were actually going to be able to hold a piece, which makes such a difference. Mm. You know, instead of just seeing an image to actually be able to, to have it in your hands and, and really see the scale and what it looks like. So do these come out of their wooden holders and actually can be worn or are they more like a wall piece? If, if they it's a wall piece. I think they're a book piece. Yeah. So I, a book piece, yeah. yeah right. I, I think piece. they stay in the wood though. New, yeah. new, new format, book piece. Exactly, we need a new category <laughs> next year. Yeah. That's great. I love it. Yeah. How about you, Harlan? Did you find any pieces that surprised you? Uh, well, I was um, happy to see it. there were a number of vessels. I don't know if I was surprised, but as a vessel maker myself, there were a number of people who um, 
Cynthia Ide and Sharon Massey and uh, Nicole, I'm trying to look over here, is it Hessen, um, Jill Baker Gower. Um, so there were a number of people making vessels in addition to the, uh, our award winner. Um, it was nice to see that format and how other people have interpreted that format. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yeah, I, I was, I, I don't know if it's really true, but I, I felt like there were more than usual yeah. number. Like the last few exhibits I've seen had seemed to have very few. Mm -hmm. um, and as a vessel maker myself, it was, I was really excited to see that. Mm -hmm. I thought the vessel submissions were really strong. Yeah, there were some, and all very, very different, mm -hmm. which I, I, I like to see that. Uh, there weren't as many wall pieces as I expected to see. There were some, but um, I thought there would be more. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Do you think these things go through um, sort of uh, fads? And I don't want to say fads, that makes it sound frivolous, but mm -hmm. do, do, do they, do, are there periods of time when jewelry is more prominent and other periods when wall pieces are more prominent, you know, more, more popular to, for artists? to work in that form. I don't know, I don't know, over time, I don't know if anybody's mm -hmm. noticed. I feel like jewelry often predominates. Definitely. Well, I mean, I feel like the history, at least the 20th, 21st century history of enameling, um, a painting had a big effect on the people doing wall uh, work in enamel. Um, Vessel makers, I think, were influenced by ceramic, and uh, jewelers, of course, were influenced by other jewelers. So those are kind of the three areas that, that enamels fell into. And and luckily, a lot uh, some of the pieces in this exhibition didn't strictly fall into one of those three groups, but mm -hmm. some of them sort of invented their own group or fell between the cracks of two groups. So uh, that that's uh, interesting too. I I was kind of thinking about. Um whether the the small submissions of wall work also related to the economy and and how expensive it is to work on a larger scale. I know mm -hmm. that wall works can also be intimate and smaller, but um, as someone who's also wearing an educator's hat, a lot of the students uh, see the cost of working on a scale that would normally present for the wall and they, whoa, <laughs> are in sticker shock. And I feel like that might be a part of it because it just doesn't seem as accessible. And, and as someone I started in the 90s, um, you know, the cost of precious metals uh, was much lower. It was much more affordable where uh, one could take risks, uh, could challenge scale and proportion, could be okay with making a mistake uh, because you weren't out, uh, you know, almost your your rent money. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder if that's a part of it. I know steel is much cheaper, but it's also um, there's also issues with that with our field in terms of process. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think especially people starting out now have a much harder time than back. Uh, many years ago. It was easier yeah. to get started. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, does anybody want to talk about a piece that really like moved you, that really touched your heart? Um, Patty, do you want to start? Sure. Um, the um, the Wyatt Nestor, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce their last name, mm -hmm. um, but- uh, The Western piece. The Western piece, mm -hmm. right. Those are um, belt buckles. Mm -hmm. And um, they just, I thought they were so beautiful. The colors were really just crisp. I love the one that was on the, the gold and it had such a lovely story and a, a strong sense of place. Um, and I found that touching. 
Um, so, you know, I, I'd like to see these as brooches. I think they make, they also do brooches, but um, I thought these would be lovely brooches as well. Yeah, they're very different imagery than you usually see in enamel, uh, you know, exhibits. It's um, very much hearkening to sort of Americana and a different time period. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really lovely when, when you can really get a strong sense of a time and a place mm -hmm. through a piece. Yeah. So these were, uh, these, you know, spoke to me. How about you, Jessica? Um, yeah, there was there's so much great work here. It's really difficult to, Hard to pick like, out pick one. Um, but I was there was one that was um, really sweet, and it was it was uh, called "Contemplating the Path" by Virginia Schneider, and it was a piece that was about navigating the pandemic. And it kind of looks. I'll see if it pops up in this slideshow but it's a circular piece that looks like a, it almost looks like a game, like a spiral game. And it had these little illustrative drawings that really are very direct and very colorful and just playful. And they had this kind of feeling of immediacy to them. And so it was just something that it definitely touched me because I think it's another piece that was of the moment and was incredibly sincere and definitely, yeah, it was this piece right here. Yeah. I just thought it was really great. And I loved, uh, I wish I could get closer to it. I would love to see this piece in person um, to really unpack some of what's happening there. There's, but there's like, you know, little zoom moments and all sorts of things that we all had to navigate in the past two years that um, I just, I really liked it. Yeah, and it, it, it sort of breaks it all down into this childish cartoon style that almost makes it, um, I don't know, it brings it out of the the, the sort of disturbing yeah. thing that it was into yes. something maybe a little lighter. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a good point. And I think there is, again, it's like always like trying to like walk that line and finding some sort of moment of tension where you have this child like, game and you know it's about something that's just so completely heavy and so serious um, and intense and it definitely it lightens the mood and it gives some sort of accessibility for all of us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and having you know this this uh imagery that evokes a child's game it's very very seems very apropos to me like it's very uh, uh, two very dissimilar things that bring brought together that work very well. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody was trying to figure out, okay, what's our next move? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good metaphor for the moment. Yeah. yeah. Right. But I think, I, you know, maybe it's interesting that um, I keep thinking that the, the dice is missing. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And, you know, maybe you couldn't really play the game, right? right. How many sides would that dice have? My gosh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I thought this point. artist's work too, uh, Jim O'Carroll, was just really, it was technically very nicely done. I really loved the painterly aspect of this work and the sense of burnout. So as someone who's interested in painterly approaches and it's just a lot of dry sifting from what I understood from the technical notes from this piece that I was really interested in. It kind of created this like soft layering that I don't see a lot in the medium. So yeah, I, they, they did that with dry sifting? Uh, that's yeah, a, that's what that's the notes amazing. are. amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Size, I will look it up. <laughs> uh -huh. No, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't have known how they did it, but yeah. that, this seems like the last thing I would have guessed. Right. I guess. Yeah, yeah. So how about you, Harlan? Was there a specific a special, a piece that moved you? Well, a number of them did. I think that uh, Mindy Heron Lewis's target practice piece, um, <clears throat> a piece that startles me at first and maybe uh, is almost a little bit 
uh, repulsive or repellent uh, at first. And then it, as you look at it more carefully, it's, it, it draws you in. Um, there's uh, mm -hmm. uh, find. a sort of feeling of um, uh, almost mysticism. Uh, there's uh, the figure itself um, uh, recalls maybe <clears throat> uh, Greek or Roman statues because of it's truncated and the arms are missing. Uh, but in this case, it's um, there's a sweetness to it too. So um, uh, that this piece struck me, and I'm familiar with Mindy's work, and I, I know uh, I've seen more of it. So uh, uh, anyway, that that's uh, one piece in particular that impressed me. Uh, and it is kind of startling um, because first, when you look at it, right, you see that sweet face. I think anyway, I did. And and then you notice the gun. <laughs> so that's it's a it's uh, definitely playing with the viewer a little bit. Um, huh. Interesting pieces you got. Those were all three very interesting pieces. I mean, as are all of these pieces, like you said, Jessica, there's so many wonderful pieces in this exhibit. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm curious what you what you all think about online exhibits. This is going to be an online exhibit. And what do you think um, is the place of online exhibits and what are your thoughts about them? Um, anybody well, want to jump it, in? It it has become a sort of a necessary direction. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, it, um, people from all over the globe can look at this work. So access to it is, is a great advantage. Yes. On the other hand, these are three-dimensional objects. And no matter how good the photograph is, it's not going to capture what a three-dimensional object looks like. And especially with enamel that has, can have translucency or transparency. And mm -hmm. that's also very difficult to capture in a photograph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was um, a necessary evil during COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, you know, I mean, it had its, it has its place, um, but I don't think it even comes close to the real thing. I really don't. Um, you know, I, we just had an experience where we had um, an online exhibition last year and then a, a live exhibition of the same work a mm -hmm. year later. And the difference is huge in terms of how you respond to an object and um, just your sense of, um, the scale of it and what happens when you when you move with it and and uh, it just on and on and on what it feels like in your hands mm -hmm. um it, it's there's it just you know i think it, it's better than not having the exhibition but it's certainly not as good as the real thing mm -hmm. Yeah, and I imagine when you see that work in the flesh, so to speak, after seeing it only digitally, I'm sure there's surprises in both directions. <laughs> Some where yeah. you're pleasantly surprised, you're like, oh, I didn't know it was that big, or oh, I didn't know it looked like that on my back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think even, you know, and again, I guess to a certain extent, um, with online exhibitions having, for jewelry at least, having the great images on the body really does help. I mean, I, I thought that mm -hmm. Sharon Massey's pieces were terrific um, and her, um, she had a neck piece. And um, I somehow later on saw an image of her wearing that piece and the scale mm -hmm. is so different mm -hmm. than what I had 
read online that it, it really changed the piece for me. Yeah, mm. that can definitely change it. There's another piece in here that, oh, we went past it a bit ago that it's um, a bug. I think it's a cicada that was on the back of the wear. When it comes up, somebody, somebody say something, but I didn't really respond to that piece until I saw the scale of it on the body. And then I was completely blown away by it. Um, mm -hmm. It really changed the reading. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah. But I wanted to say something else about the online exhibitions. Um, so like when I was a student in, in grad school, that was or in the early 2000s, that's when online exhibitions really started to begin, as, if I remember correctly, that they were out there, but they weren't really, uh, I should, I just to be honest, they weren't really respected as a form of exhibiting yet. Uh, and I think over the years that has completely changed and COVID definitely moved that needle a little bit, quite a bit forward, right? And now I, I have a completely different view on it. And I agree with everything that Harlan and Patty said about it. Um, but again, wearing my educator's hat, I think for students who are trying to make a presence in their field, to get their name out there, to build their resume, to get that line. We used to make a joke in grad school. It's like every line on that resume at the time was like, well, there's another 80 bucks. <laughs> you just count, right? Count the jury shows. And, um, and it was a real, it was a real drain financially. And so to not have to ship a piece, to not yeah. have to pay for the packing, yeah. For someone who's an emerging artist or a student artist, um, it's it's a real gift to be able to get that kind of exposure um, for a fraction of the cost. So I, I again, it's a it's two sides of the coin, but mm -hmm. I think they have their place and that they can be incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. And I love that I can see all this work. And you know, if this was yeah. in New York, I'm in the Midwest, I wouldn't see any of this. Um, and so I, I'm grateful for somebody who lives in a semi-rural region that I'm able to have access to some stellar work. Yeah, it definitely has some huge benefits that way, for mm -hmm. sure. And so what do you, what do you, how, how do you think that the photography enters into it in that case? Um, you know, I, I, I just wonder yeah. about that. Right, it's, it's not just, these people are not just uh, an analyst. They're, they also either have to hire a photographer or be a photographer to, mm -hmm. to represent their work well. Right, so when you're talking about, about um, costs, mm -hmm. it, you know, if you don't become an excellent photographer on your own, mm -hmm. um, then the cost of having your work photographed could be the same as shipping a piece somewhere. You mm -hmm. are correct. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Photography has uh, always been important. Yes. Um, you know, even when I started out, <clears throat> um, the difference is that because of digital photography, it's a little easier for uh, people to be able to take good photographs. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's it's still a skill to it, but now we can take dozens of shots of a piece and pick out the best one and you can even tweak it on, on Photoshop or whatever to um, get the best possible picture. Mm -hmm. um, frequently, yeah. I mean, in the past, um, I mean, I was a juror for a couple of shows where we juried the show from images, mm -hmm. but then there was an actual show. And as uh, Jessica said, sometimes it's shocking yeah. uh, the difference between what it looked like in the picture and what it looked like, sometimes happily so, and sometimes with disappointment, but uh, uh, photography has always been important. And I think that that's where I start frequently as a juror, eliminating pieces, because if I can't see what the piece looks like, or it's a bad photograph, it's out of focus, or it's got a distracting background, that's an easy way to eliminate a piece. Mm -hmm. I, I think also when you're photographing your work, it's really important to photograph it so that um, you're showing the real size of the piece. Yeah. That can be a real challenge. Yeah. Yes. 
but I think it makes it's important and it does make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, if you're wearing, if you're making jewelry, that's an easier problem to solve right. because you can. Well, put it I'm on speaking that. about jewelry from jewelry. Right. jewelry. Uh, thinking about this vessel, for example, I don't know. I mean, I know when I was a student, you put a penny in in your image, right? And uh, I think that's definitely gone away <laughs> as a student. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> that seems kind of archaic now. <laughs> Completely. And then it would also be yeah. in black velvet or something. Right. right. Black velvet. <laughs> but I, yeah, that can be that can be a real challenge. And even when you clearly have the scale in the, in the image notes, um, it's hard to rectify that with your eyes, like what that is. But I mean, I, I even I put it in my jurors comments about this show, the importance of photography, because I thought there were so many more pieces that would have been in this exhibition mm -hmm. had they been photographed properly. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing that it was only going to be experienced online, there was no way that those pieces could make it past the first round because mm -hmm. there's no other opportunity for them to be seen. So yeah, yeah all the things that Harlan was saying about um, making sure that things weren't blurry if it's a dimensional object and, you know, cropping properly and, and light and neutral, you know, backgrounds. There was a lot of stuff happening in those images that we juried. Um, and I would say if you can afford it in the beginning, it might be helpful to hire a photographer. I know when I was a student, uh, I would trade artwork for photography services. Um, or take a workshop. There's all sorts of amazing online workshops now where you can learn how to use your iPhone uh, to document artwork properly. And it is so much easier than it used to be. Thank God that 35 millimeter slides have died. Um, but, uh, you know, there's no excuses at this point is how I feel. Right. So get Very it. True. And then true. don't don't fake it. So it can be a lot of smoke and mirrors. So don't create an entirely new piece by spending <clears throat> hours on Photoshop. If you get if you get a good shot, you should have to do very minimal work uh, digitally through software to to adjust anything. Maybe just the size and a little cropping, but that should be it. Well, I think I, you know an example was the Supergirl medallion, right? The the photograph was so good. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and it could be that if that hadn't been there, it might not have been as effective. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Good point. Good point. So, well, it's, we're, we're getting to the end. So I, I think we should start to wrap things up. So I'm wondering if, um, you have any final thoughts or feelings about, um, the exhibit, the works or the direction that you feel the field is going or any, you know, any final thoughts that you might wanna, wanna throw out there. Well, that's any the bug piece, the, just to put that out there. What? <laughs> that was the image of that, yeah. The, see that bottom right image of it on the body? Oh yeah. That's a different piece. That's a different piece? Yeah. Why is it on the image then? It's yeah. The piece, see how they're, I don't think it's the same piece. I think no, it's no, it's, it comes apart. It's yeah. Like in two pieces. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so you it, see it was, the two uh, pieces okay. on the left, the one piece in the middle and the, the second piece being worn. Oh, the two pieces together in the middle. And yeah, then it's the, rather complicated. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Talking about the exhibition in general, mm -hmm. I was uh, glad to see that some very accomplished anomalists who have a uh, long reputation of producing work did enter the show uh, so that we're people like Martha Banyas and, and uh, Cynthia Ide and, and Sharon Messy, uh, Barbara McFadden and name a lot of them. But there were also new people, people who maybe this was the first time they entered a show, I don't know. Uh, there were certainly a lot of people that I didn't wasn't familiar with their work. So I was glad to see that wide range. Uh, I think the people, um, have been doing it a long time, don't need another line on their resume, but um, <laughs> uh, it, um, it was good to see their work. Mm -hmm. Well said, I agree 100%. And I'm, I'm very, I I'm, was very heartened to see such a wonderful quality of work submitted and um, was really honored, was just honored to be asked. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to see all this great work and to talk about it. So it's a real honor for me. 
Well, that's wonderful. I feel the, the same way that I've never looked at so many enamels before. And it was a wonderful experience for me. And I've learned so much just from listening to Harlan and Jessica. So thank you. Oh, thank, thank you all. I, we are just honored to have the three of you, such eminent um, people in your field, uh, be jurors for this show. I think it really um, was just a wonderful thing for the Guild and for the show. So thank you very much. And, and thank, I want to also thank um, Judy Wickich and um, Chris Asage and um, Kim, who is our president, because they helped to organize the show. And um, it's, it's a wonderful show. And thank you to them for the hard work that they do. And, um, and, and thanks to everybody who came to listen to this uh, panel. And I think it was an interesting conversation. I certainly enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> so, um, so thanks to everyone and, um, and, and I guess we'll, we'll wrap it up then. I don't know if you wanted to say anything else, Kim. Um, just want to thank everybody for your participation, all of you on the panel and everyone who participated in the exhibition and thank Judy Wukic, our chair and Chris Asai for all the tech help. And the exhibition is available at Enamel Guild northeast.org, along with our three previous exhibitions. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, just go ahead and have a look. All right. Goodbye, everybody. This has been Thanks. great. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Happy Enamel Bye. Day. Bye.